Welcome to the Alien Probe Podcast. Bob Lazar was a brilliant young physicist who found himself employed at a top secret facility in the middle of the desert outside Las Vegas. Under the watchful eye of the government elite, he was tasked with understanding an exotic propulsion system being used by an advanced aerospace vehicle he was told came from outer space. It was Bob Lazar who blew the whistle and ultimately revealed to the world the secrets he knew about America's outer space program. Joining me today again, after a week off, Dr. Bill, how's it going? Hey, how are you doing? Good. What's going on? We So we both uh, are big Bob Lazar fans. I, um, You know, he had the Joe Rogan. Did you see the Joe Rogan, Bob Lazar YouTube? Yeah, yeah, I uh, saw it. You. Uh, you're, you're the one that told me to listen to that. I saw it. It was yeah, good. I mean, I said at the time that um, after seeing this, you'll be a believer. So I was a believer. You know, I did not believe it before, but it made me even more. I mean, this guy could spin. A, I mean, he had every detail. And it has had every detail since, you know, he started this. Uh, so he, he, since he came out with the story. So I think we should roll into just him doing, you know, what he did. What on it. he was at Area Fifty One, he was tasked with reverse engineering the propulsion system of a saucer. Well, we don't know if it's saucer. There was nine different uh, spacecraft out at S Four, uh, which was south of Area Fifty One, and he was tasked with uh, reverse engineering the propulsion system of this uh, saucer. So there, uh, he and uh, what was the guy's name that his, his, his he was in with uh, he was with a partner uh, in this facility. Uh, they don't give uh, it, it seems they only give certain people certain areas to uh, look into when they're doing this, right? Yeah, it looks like he, what he's saying is that they um, compartmental. Mm -hmm. and their job was to examine the propulsion system. Right. Um, that's actually one of the things that's interesting about his story. And I don't know if you mentioned this. This is a, we, we just finished reading his book, Dreamland, an autobiography that just, I think it just came out. Yeah, it's so by, should... uh, featured by George Knapp, who was instrumental in him coming out with the story um, toward the end of the saga. Yeah, we should give him give him some credit for this. I don't know when it came out. I'm trying to look at the title page, but I don't see it. I have, oh, here it is. I have uh, an ebook, so it's, it's at the end. So this came, just came out 2019. So it's, it's a couple of years old. Fairly, fairly new. And I would yeah. urge anyone that's interested in the story to definitely read Dreamland, uh, uh, an autobiography by Bob Lazar. So, you know, so he's reverse engineering this thing. He's, it's important to know because when you watch, and I don't know if you, I'm sure you got this also because it was in the book, but he was only there like, what, nine, he only spent nine days doing on at S4. Is that what you kind of got out of it too? I mean, I read. I, I, I didn't count the days that he was there, but he, um, it looks like he worked for, he worked for eg and G, which was the subcontractor that hired him to work at this facility he worked for them for one paycheck. Yeah, because he showed he had he had a paycheck that he showed people. And I guess he had a, a you know W two from them, and um, so he was there for whatever their pay period was. It could have been two weeks, could have been a month. I don't know what the what the pay periods are. Yeah, it was like so. nine days. It was like nine hundred and fifty one dollars, and he showed his buddy Gene that he confided in the check, and he was kind of awestruck that it was so small based. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, I was looking at that because at that same time I was working for a biotech company when he was doing that, and that was uh, for me that was like two weeks pay. Yeah, and that was that you know that this is nineteen eighty nine was when he was doing that. That's when I was working for a biotech company, and I was actually pretty shocked to see yeah. to see that. So maybe he's so he's being paid on this highly classified project. He's being they're paying him peanuts basically. Yeah. Oh. And so that's nine kind days. of, that, yeah, that's kind nine of, days would be two weeks. That'd be a two week salary. Yeah. yeah. So, 
I don't know. It's just we're talking about the story. So he he was while he was at S four. They uh, talked about how the propulsion system. They don't know. They know conceptually how it could work, but they never really. They never really discovered specifically how this thing works. Um, he, well, they had a. It was like a, it was like a, a cylinder, and then they had a like a another. I guess it was like a ball that they would put a fuel pellet in and close the ball up and then you'd move it towards the the larger garbage can size cylinder and then that would create gravity effects yeah. and that's what they were they were studying uh, he was saying that one of his contributions was uh the facility apparently had the raw material for the fuel which he said was um uh, element 115 because the guy uh dennis dennis yeah. magiani yeah. His uh, the security guy. His oh, I got to. Yeah, that's one of the interesting things is that he actually named some names, which was was interesting. And the guy he worked with, I don't remember the guy's name, and I didn't make a note of it. He had that guy's name. But did you think that's a real name? Uh, for the security guy, I don't know. It's Barry. hard to say. It was Barry. Ba Barry was the sec Barry was the guy was, he was working with. Yeah, he was, that was his partner in the lab. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard to say, but he wasn't concealing his name, so you assume that his partner in the lab wasn't concealing his name. But that's one of the things that we're talking about with details with this book is uh, he does give a lot of details and he gives names, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, the guy came in with the raw material and said we need to make more like fuel pellets, and so Lazar is like he came up with the. Uh, idea of how to make the fuel pellets and then went up to uh, Los Alamos um, and had the machine shop up there, which apparently is used to working with um, like plutonium and uranium and stuff, create more fuel pellets. And one of the things that's not in the, in this book, it's, it's, he's been telling this story for 30 years. And one of the things that there's details that have come out that he doesn't, uh, talk about and he, he didn't talk about 115 and the rumor or the speculation that he actually has some of it because remember that you saw the documentary yep where they had the three second clip of the um cloud chamber yeah. which didn't show anything but he was saying um i think gene the reporter that he worked with was saying that he'd actually seen a demonstration in this cloud chamber where the cloud where this substance had either bent light or caused uh, cosmic rays to bend or something. I don't know what was going on. But supposedly, um, I saw something with that reporter who, or somewhere that said that Lazar didn't get his piece of uh, 115 from the facility. He kept a piece when he went up to the uh, Los Alamos to get it milled into the right shapes. Yeah. Yeah, because they, yeah. they made him... They made Los Alamos give them any fragments that, as they trimmed this thing and made it uh, that shape that they brought the plants for, made them give yeah. back all the material. So he probably just snaked a little bit of that material. Um, yeah, that's 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 the implication is that he just kept a piece. Um, oh, and then in the introduction to the book, uh, they talk about the raid on his um, business, yeah. where they had a bunch of. Uh, agents come in and they were looking for some, the story is that there was a uh, um, guy that had bought, I can't remember what the chemical was from him and then poisoned his wife. Oh, wow. So they, but they came in there and it was, it's, I don't know, the, the government's work weird these days. They went in there and they cloned all his computers and, and stuff. So, but they had, he was saying, I don't remember. They had, uh, you know, 20 agents come in to search the search, searches business. Yeah. So. yeah. so, so he would get a call. He'd be at home and ran. I mean, it isn't like you go in every day. So he lived in Las Vegas. I think it was uh, the Janice. He would get a call. Oh, you need to come in. So he'd have to hop in his car, get dressed, hop in his car, grab his bag, um, get on the, they called it Janice flight. It was a white, they're white 737s or A737 at McCarran yeah. uh, Airport. He'd hop on this flight. I think it was a 15-minute flight. It was like puddle jump almost, but it was a jet. And then yeah. 
down into down into Area 51, then they take a bus to this facility outside, well, within 51 at S4, um, again, out uh, south of the actual facility of Area 51. And they would have, so they saw the saucer, so let's kind of, you know. You, you, well, you, yeah, yeah, and he, he would, he had said he'd seen them twice. Once he had, was dropped off by the, bus and the hangar doors were open and these these hangars are like built into the the hillside or the mountainside or something so he he walked into the hangar instead of going around to the door that he normally went in and says he saw a flying saucer in the hangar with an american flag painted on it backwards which is um i think is is i don't know if he was a boy scout or not but there was a that that doesn't make any sense it well, it made sense to me, and the ma- reason it makes sense to me is because now on the on the military uniforms, they put the um, American flag on the right shoulder, and they used to put it on the left shoulder. Because I used to have a um, uh, a jacket that was uh, that was an Air Force. I don't. Um, what do they call it? It was anyway. It was an Air Force jacket. The flight jacket? bomber jacket. Bomber jacket, but it wasn't yeah. leather. It was the, yeah. it was the the synthetic stuff and that one had a uh, patch on the right shoulder and the thing is is that the the stars traditionally as we learned in the boy scouts many many years ago when you hang up a flag on a wall uh you hang it so the stars are to the left yes because it's always odd to me when i see the opposite yeah it's like weird when the stripes are on the left or the yeah Yeah. but now the military what they do is they put the uh the flag on the left shoulder on uniforms. And so that looks odd to me. And the reason they do that and the, the stripes are to the left. The reason they do that is because the, when you go into battle, the flag's not supposed to be backwards. So I don't know why they switch the flag from one shoulder to the other. So whenever I see that, it always looks backwards to me. So, uh, he's, he said the flag was backwards. He saw it on the, on the saucer. And that's one of the details little details that he always points out. Yeah. And then he like, kind of, as he walked by, he kind of breaths, you know, he kind of put his, like you would a car. He kind yeah. of brushes his hand and the security, get away from, get away. Yeah. No touching the crap, no touching or stuff. You know, and, then they, and then they beat him. Then they beat him. Yeah. No, they didn't beat him. So, yeah. So that's the first time he saw it. The second time they did a uh, low performance test. They, they, uh, well, well, let's say, okay. They did a, uh, before they did the low performance test, they actually let him go inside one of the, the, the craft that they'd been flying. And uh, what he observed, you know, it was like molded almost into one, it's like molded one piece. But, yeah, you yeah. know, down, it had two uh, stories or two decks, I should say. And, well, it, it, it had, apparently it had three levels because there was the pilot level, which he wasn't allowed to go into. Right. And there was the propulsion, um, so, pilot, passenger, and like the lower uh, propulsion, maybe something to do with the propulsion lo- level. I don't know. Yeah, well, he has a um, he actually um, designed a model uh, that was sold by testers. Yeah, Joe Rogan was trying to get. I think Joe Rogan got one. You can still get them. Yeah, yeah, they're on eBay. I actually was looking at them. They sell for they're a little pricey, um, hundred bucks or something. It's, it's, it's not. It's. It's, it was it's more, inhibit. It. It's inhibitory. It not. Um, I, I think I'm going to get one though. I think. Oh, uh, I'm seeing. I just put it in the computer. Here's one for um, 114. Yeah, I was. I'm interested in buying one too. But I've I've spent all my money on UFO books. <laughs> um, <laughs> you haven't read them all yet. You're just kind of. No, I'm, I'm. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna resell it no i um yeah I, i'm gonna read them all i'm gonna i tell you i'm gonna read them all i'm actually right now i'm reading uh carl sagan's autobiography because he was um and that was because he did that uh triple as meeting about ufos yeah and i wanted to get some of the background on that and one of the things is uh oh we'll talk about this more in the future but carl sagan was considered a ufo skeptic but he was willing to address ufos and that got him um, a lot of heat with um, um, 
you know, his colleagues and stuff. And one of them was Menzel, who was an early debunker of UFOs, who was his chairman at Harvard. And I think of Sagan's of willingness to address sort of the UFO issue hurt him when it came to get time, time to get uh, tenure at Harvard. But then he went to Cornell and he was great for it yeah, forever. They, but yeah, so Sagan, uh, Sagan's story ties in with a lot of this other stuff we were reading and it's, it's pretty interesting. Well, Steve, yeah, I'm looking at the model. Steve yeah? wants to, uh, he wants to do a, a segment on the podcast about contact. I guess there's a backstory. Uh, oh, know, oh yeah. 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 I was going to say, I was going to say that watch. I just watched contact this last week. Watch it again. Oh, I have. Yeah. I'm going to have to before I, I haven't seen it. Quite yeah. yeah watch, watch it. Watch it again. It's, um, uh, and think about like, uh, just watch it again and then we'll talk about it. But I, I've been reading this stuff and then Sagan's an interesting guy. So he was, um, he, he, um, he, he took a lot of heat for his willingness to engage the idea of UFOs. So I'm looking at the model. Oh yeah. The, the model has uh, there's one on eBay for, you know, a small fortune. What is this? Test, oh, it's it's what, testers, what? right? Yeah. It's testers. It's testers. Kind of funny uh, test, I used to build, you know, I used to build models all the time when I was a kid. Yeah. And test yeah, was we all did. Of, testers was kind of the crappy model. <laughs> It was kind of the, <laughs> they, we buy a tester's model kit. It was kind of the crappy one. As if, I forget the names of the other ones, but there was, yeah. it was like the low end. It was like the, oh, ah, Rebel. There's the, Rebel. Yeah, Rebel was the good one. And you get a test, it's like nothing else is interesting on the shelf of the grocery store that you can remember you used to go to a grocery store and buy models. And, oh, yeah, they used to, <laughs> I forgot about that. Um, you know, my dad would go, you know, he'd get paid, we'd go, Grocery shopping. After he got paid, we go there. Go ahead, pick yourself out a model, and I find a then be all the Ravels would go eat all right, and then uh, I gotta get a testers. Man, these are so. I'm not gonna leave here without anything. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'd go build yeah, it. So, so the diagram on the back of the uh, what is this? A UFO? What do they call it? This this is. Area S4 UFO, so testers calls it the Area 51 UFO. On the back of the box, there's a diagram, and you can see the three levels. There's the bottom level. What's on which the bottom? The bottom is that it says gravity. Oh, it's the propulsion. Amplifier yeah. out. The emitter. The emitter, they called it in the book. Yeah, and core plates. And then the middle of the thing, it says gravity amplifier head, I think. And yeah. then it has a waveguide, which he said there was a pipe coming from the thing. And up, up at the top, there's waveguide terminator, which sticks out of the top of the thing. And, and he doesn't show or say anything in the model about the uh, top level, which was where the pilots are supposed to s sit. But And then he shows the diagram on the, on the box, shows that the, um, these things are wave gravity amplifier. Uh, they can pivot. So that to gives you that he was describing that in the book, they yeah. pivot so it could provide uh, direction and propulsion, a push or whatever. Well, it's it was doing. actually it said it was actually pulling almost, you know, instead of as you would think of a jet pushing gases out the rear, and, and it actually did something to almost fold gravity to so you're actually being pulled. Yeah, um, did you watch that video I sent you on? Um, Warp drive, that little short one. No, I didn't see that. One. Oh, okay. Well, I sent you a video, and it was by um, I think PBS Space Time because there's a new paper that came out, and this sort of ties into what Bob Lazar was saying. Although his description was very much like a tesseract in the book, uh, which was really popular when we were kids. I think it's still popular. A Wrinkle in Time. Yeah. And. Disney just made a terrible movie. Well, they, they constantly make terrible movies of this this book. It's a great <laughs> book. But uh, the description, he his description matched the description that they used in A Wrinkle of Time of a Tesseract, which was folding space. And yeah. this uh, PBS video, uh, they were talking about newer papers that had came out. And basically, it's your warping space in front of the craft and uh, this is real science. You warp the space that this theories that these physicists are coming up with, you warp the space in front of the craft 
Uh, and by doing manipulating the space around the craft, it allows you to pa- to travel uh, faster than the speed of light or that at was, the speed of light. That was in what you sent me? Yeah. I yeah. did see. Yes, I did see. I tried to open everything you sent me. <laughs> okay, but what, the thing that's the thing that's interesting about that that video in, that caught my eye is they're talking about. So the earlier papers were saying that in order to do this sort of uh, space warping would require all the energy available in the galaxy, our galaxy. So it's like it's 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 not going to happen. The most recent papers that came out calculated they made some changes they calculated that it would only require 10 percent of the sun's energy to get this craft to warp space to get this whatever you're making to warp space uh the only difficult is they can't figure out they can they can figure out how to warp the space they can't figure out how, how to get the craft to move under th- under their theory but what right. caught my eye was that we've gone from and this is what happens with this stuff and it it makes you think that possibly someday this type of warp drive will be be functional is they've gone from it will take all the energy in the galaxy to do this to 10 percent the energy of our sun to do this so to 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 create a yeah and then then only the energy that was provided by a 72 pinno as they go yeah 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 yeah. and then it will go then it will go back and you know they'll do another calculation they'll do it that's they just don't know. So the, well, it, what's interesting is that the energy requirement is is getting smaller. Yeah. So I mean, As that's I said, the, the yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. You know, in six months you're going to have Doc Brown. Someone like Doc Brown's going to go. Wait a minute, you can do this with the the power of a pinno. Yeah. So that's right. <laughs> yeah. We just don't know. Yeah. Or, or it, yeah. It's, it's it's an ongoing, you know, it's an ongoing uh, study. Of the warp well, capability. Well, the, well, the, the what's interesting is it's gone from very, very impossible to very, very difficult theoretically. Yeah, which is a bit, which is a huge jump, which is why they put that that video out, and they were talking about these papers. That's a, a huge jump in in possibility right there. So, uh, coming back to Bob Lazar, so he uh, one of the things that he was, oh, uh, what? Where do we want to go with this? We want to talk the about more. What he well, oh, oh, yeah, the spaceships. Yeah. yeah. Well, so he saw he, he was crawling around the spaceships. He didn't right. get to go in the top. Um, and then afterwards, he they saw a field test. Well, wait, wait. Like inside the ship on the crew, it would be a crew level. Is three a seat that could fit three small children size, presumably. That was the, that was the crew deck, which you would, I guess would be the crew that, deck or a passenger that deck. That was the that was the middle level of the yeah. the ship. Yeah, and it was just molded into. He said yeah. was, there was no seams, there was no rivets. It was just smooth. Everything was just like like plastic injection molding. It just plop with this thing together, and uh, whatever material it was that they used, obviously, if it's flying through space and maybe doing coming into the any atmosphere. Uh, with you know how hot it you know how much heat yeah. it makes, yeah. it would have to you know be of a, some sort of material um, well, to be smooth. And there's a couple of things. Um, it's like when Howard Hughes. If you've seen the Howard Hughes movie with uh, what's his name that DiCaprio, that actor, I can't remember DiCaprio. DiCaprio. Yeah, there's a scene in there where he's um, uh, where they're making the he's trying to set uh, airspeed records with an aircraft. Yeah. That's what he was telling his uh, his engineers to make it smoother, make the plane smoother, yeah. and you know get the rivets down and, and do all that stuff. And there's an a, uh, in this book that I was reading about Sagan, where he's uh, Sagan would go out and investigate himself UFO sightings and interview people, which didn't engender a lot of love with his colleagues. Yeah. But he was talking with um, uh, a guy who worked at the navy at a navy. Um, Navy shipyard, and the guy was describing a UFO, and he was describing the panels and how they were riveted together on the UFO. And Sagan's like, "Rivets, really? You think that a UFO is going to have rivets?" So, 
No, because yeah, yeah, you know. a little bit of uh, yeah, no, because yeah, 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 no, yeah. So yeah, but so, anyway, yeah, yeah. That's, so middle that's deck, what, yep. Middle deck crew crew ca- crash couches. Yep. Anything. And, and then he couldn't go on the top deck. So yeah, so he saw the low. Perf- they really moved on. The next thing was the low performance test of this thing, right? So yeah. they go out. Yep. It's him and a Barry. And, you know, Mary. there's a guy sitting there that presumably he's got some headgear on. Now, something I kind of realize is who's small, you know, you're not your average uh, human probably wouldn't even be able to fit up at that top level and be able to fly this thing. So he did mention that he saw a gray alien. Uh, yeah, yeah on, he didn't mention that. He didn't mention that in the book, though. Yeah, I saw it in the other documentation. In the the uh, interview, uh, the yeah. documentary. Yeah, the yeah. documentary and the uh, document you sent to me, um, the debunker guy, uh, Mr. Mahood. I think it's in that one too. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, so he saw a great, but yeah, it's weird. There are some discrepancies between the documentary and you know, as we look into it, and we're going to look into that. A little bit in a little bit, but uh, the gray, I think, if I mean, if this is real, that they were using you know the alien to uh, you know, fly this thing for uh-huh. them. you know, they I mean, can it unless they get a really small pilot? Because if I don't know, well, 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 that's it, that's interesting because it's like what that was one of the things that um, NASA had with the early pilots is that they had height and weight restrictions. Oh yeah, and, and it, when I was at the when I used to go to DC all the time, I I would if I had time, which I really did. I one of the times I I managed to go to the Smithsonian Space and Air Museum, and you go over and they have an old um, astronaut's uh, spacesuit. It might have been a moon suit. I can't remember which one it was, but you, it's a real one that's on display, and it's it's small. I mean, the guy that was in this—I don't know which who's who wore this suit because they were made for each astronaut. And I'm like looking at, and they had it up on a little platform, so it made it a little higher. And I'm looking at that, and I was just going, "Hi, I'm an astronaut." Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> the, they obviously whoever suit this was, uh, this guy was probably like five four, five five. Um, so it was like a little guy. So I, I, they can find little guys to cram into these things if they need to. Um, yeah, but. Do they know how to? I mean, I don't know. Do they know how to pilot this thing? The other thing is. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. What is it inside this thing that? Because and you know, we'll move on to the when they went into the desert and observed an actual high performance test. Um, you get slammed against a bulkhead. Well, it's it's like Star Trek when they go into warp drive. What what enables them not to get thrown around or splat splattered and d- dissolve? When they hit warp drive inside, well, what they're, is inside? They're they're warping the space in front of the craft or behind the craft. They're yeah. not warping it. So, according supposedly, according to your frame of reference, you would not experience any uh, motion. Right. So you're you're at and whatever gravity you're at, it could be zero, it could be yeah. whatever. I guess. Uh, you're warping the space in front of the... Oh, so here's a good example. So he's talking about... Um, uh, I don't know if that's a good example. All right, that might be a good example. He's, they're talking about... Uh, I think you're talking about localized. He was seeing that with the with the device. It's not a good example. But when they were testing, he's talking about testing the device, and you take the, the sphere and you move it towards the the emitter, and the gravity starts you know going weird and and around the emitter. Um, it, uh, it doesn't affect them. So they're not, the, the gravity is very confined and restricted to the, to the area. So I suspect that, um, like I said, I don't think this is the best example. I suspect that in a larger, according to the pictures that I saw in this, uh, space time, PBS space time warp drive thing, um, uh, that your frame of reference is different than where the warp is created so you wouldn't be crushed or maybe not even feel the effects of acceleration 
that makes sense. Yeah. I like one of the, one of the things that's interesting is, is, uh, they, they had the emitter. I would, I would, uh, I was just wondering, they had this emitter and they have, you have it pointing, they had it upside down comp compared in the lab, supposedly upside down compared to how you would put it in the spacecraft. And I wonder how long it took them to figure out to put it uh, face up versus face down. Because if you brought the, uh, the, the ball close to it, if it was face down, it would like shoot through the ceiling. Yeah. 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 yeah it was pretty anyway. crazy. Yeah. Anyway. So they, so then they went on to the, you know, that was ex more or less his experience inside the facility at S4. And then he decided it'd be a good idea to take some friends and family. Um, oh yeah. But, uh, he, they saw a limited test, but he said he also saw, um, seven or eight more saucers of various sizes. Nine, nine in the hangar. total. Nine total. Nine total. Saucers. Of various um, now in sizes the, in the in the Joe Rogan um, YouTube and podcast, he said that they actually found a craft. Some it's like some farmer was tilling this field or something. They found it underneath the earth back in the eighteen hundreds almost. I mean the oh, thing had been underneath the ground, and then he dug it up, and it it was um, you, you know they've been they've been collecting these things. You know, I don't huh. know where they thought to, I don't know where this thing was kept in somebody's barn or something. <laughs> like an old Corvette, you drive by and there's a vet and somebody, you know, like you always hear. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was grand. Yeah. Uh, you can have it for 200 bucks, you know. You always hear those yeah. stories, which I've yeah. never run across myself. Um, uh, oh, I, yeah, I know. Everyone, but, you hear the stories because of that. But no, it's a UFO. What's that? I don't know. So it eventually makes its way over the years into the military and uh, S4. And that's one of them. So it yeah. probably has dirt clods on, no, I don't know. So, yeah. It, it, yeah. you know, they do it, but they were all, it's, it's important to note that they were all different. The one that they saw a test that they were using and test showing the test, they, they call it the sport model. And it was, yeah. what did they say, 30, 50, 30 feet? wide and 20 uh some it's pretty pretty fat it's like 20 27 yeah feet. i mean it's pretty big but they said that's a sport model that there is a bigger you know obviously bigger models i mean you almost think that these things aren't the ones they use for interstellar travel you know it's almost is there a mothership you know oh, it's like a like a scout ship yeah 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 yeah, yeah kind of like you know independence day you know that they, they there was yep. another there's another ship somewhere behind the moon or or, yeah, or I'm looking, something i'm looking at his uh his box again for the model that they made i'm going to do the yeah. size yeah maybe you could, i'd like to say the thing was like 20 it was big it's like pretty fat it's well it's it's almost fatter than it is um it's well they're not showing the the oh, scale they don't show the scale on there. Yeah, they do. I'm actually. I need. To, I'm using the calculator right now. Uh, so, thirteen times forty-eight divided by twelve. Uh, huh. It's the one that he the testers model scaled up is fifty-two feet wide, and the height would be. I thought it was twenty-seven, but let's see well, I... this is. This is a this is the model though. So this one would be this one is at the scale is fifty two. Maybe I did it wrong. So you're saying it was twenty seven? Twenty seven fat, like this the 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 gate. Uh, uh yeah, that 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 fits. That fits. It looks like it's half as tall as it is as wide. So damn. it's fifty two and twenty seven feet um tall. The deck, all yeah. three decks, yeah, all that, three decks, yeah, twenty seven yeah. feet. Yeah. That's what the um, numbers come out. So they go. So let's go to the. Um, oh yeah. So he he took friends to see flight. What he called flight flight tests. Lots of witnesses. They filmed videos. They did it three times. Yeah, the first and, two times they got away with it. It wasn't on military. It was on these behind the mountains uh, with you know, Papoose Lake and everything and Area Fifty One on the other side of these mountains. But the thing came up high enough to do the high performance tests. 
and they could yeah. see it move on. So the first one, it was kind of like they saw it, at a, but the second one, the thing actually, the ship actually came up toward them, and they they moved behind. They had an RV at this point where they brought. It's like they went up there, drank beer, and they're watching this thing and filming, and it was like an event for them. Um, but it came pretty close. Yeah. Um, it did those those tests we talked about where it would go, you know, just go forward quickly and then all of a sudden go make a 90 degree, not a turn, but it was just 90 degrees. Um, yeah. And shoot off that way. And uh, so and then it would settle back down into where it was over by S4. But the third time they did it, um, base security caught them. They took their, uh, they caught them, sent them on their way. And uh, then the, when they got onto the public road, then there was a sheriff waiting for them. Yeah. And uh, the sheriff asked for everybody's ID. And according to the book, the, according to the book, the sheriff took everybody's ID, called in, gave everybody's ID back to them, and then looked at Lazar and said, they know you down there and kind of nodded to the base. But yeah. if you look at the what you had sent me with the Jeep, there was the guy Gene, his friend, he had made no mention of any special anything where Lazar on this. He said they took the IDs and gave them back. He didn't say mention anything about them uh, making that indication about Lazar, them knowing that Lazar was uh, somehow connected to the base. So there's a discrepancy. Yeah. There's a discrepancy. You know, we're, you know, it's I didn't but, I was all about this. Until, well, I, you know, there's there's elements of of truth in what he's saying, and then there's things that are questionable. Yeah, and I would say, uh, all right. So if if we look at if you want to if you want to look at his past and his story, yeah, let's, let's okay. So now we we've, we've that that's as juicy as it gets as yeah. far as what he's seen, what he's worked on. His however many day one pay period they worked there, and now we moved on. The okay, now they take he comes out. We're gonna kind of go backwards a little bit. Well, we're gonna go forward a little bit, then we're gonna jump to the beginning. Okay. Um, so they take his. He comes out, does this deal with uh, uh, George Knapp on uh, on this radio show. Yep. And then he comes out, then all of a sudden. His whole history of his uh, his being in is wiped out. His whole his life has been wiped out. I mean, yeah. all of the you know all yep. of the all of the things that it starts with. He wasn't really born. <laughs> he has no well, birth that's... certificate. He has no birth certificate. Yeah, we'll we'll address that. So that's easy. That's easy to address. Yeah, well, they said from the, the documentation, he was like, George Knapp said he concurred that he could, he could but he, he wasn't looking in the right place. Yeah. He was born in Coral Gables, Florida, and they were looking at the holiday. So Knapp, or whoever the investigator was, looked in the, they were looking, they went to the hospital. You don't, you and I both know, you don't go to the hospital to look for birth records. No, no. You know, you go to the health department of the county of the birth or the the Florida uh, State Department of Health and Rehabilitation and Vital Statistics. Um, Well, the hospital, the hospital, I think at that time, generally they would have a birth record, but it would be they would have like a book, a birth book. Right. Which will record birth. And um, he he mentions that. I think Knapp mentions that. Is that the guy's name, Knapp, the reporter? Yeah. He he mentions that, so it's it's we've experienced that with with stuff that we've been doing. You're going yeah. back and you try to find records from, you know, forty fifty years ago, and it's a it's a it's a it's takes some work. Well, he was adopted. It, now he was adopted. We all know. Yeah. We just explored uh, when I did the show last week with Kevin. Maybe we could explore the fact that it doesn't have your that name it has yeah when you're born you're like i my name i had when i was born is completely different than the name that i have now when i was adopted Which it, yep yeah so your, your your other brother kevin yeah 
my other brother, Kevin, <laughs> since I have two of them, that's always fascinating to people. Um, so the, the social security number issued in the New York, in New York, um, was, well, something was wrong with that too. Well, I don't know about that because it's like uh, social security, people don't know the past and they don't know the history and we're old enough where we know the history. We didn't get our social security numbers until like the eighth grade. It wasn't required. Now, as you've seen with your kids and, and yeah. my kid, you get your social you get it right away. So you you sign up for the the social security number essentially at birth now. But when we were kids, uh, we we were like I can't. It's like seventh or eighth grade. And it's like oh, it's time for you to fill out do your social security thing. Yeah, um, he, he did it in seventy four, which was you know sometime like we did. Yeah, uh, so he's it's there's nothing. I think there's nothing dramatic about it. Around the same time. Yeah. So uh, that's not an issue. The birth certificate isn't that confusing. He's adopted. And as you, we, we and you and your yeah. brother and know all the, all the ins and outs of that stuff, that creates a challenging problem. Right. Then he went so, to high, his high school. I mean, he, he's saying that everything's wiped out since the beginning of the time, but it's actually somewhat explainable. Yeah, I think he's exaggerated his his education, though, and which, which I've seen before. And, and and people who smart people who feel that they um, there are lots of smart people out there that haven't gone to the university and haven't got you know masters and haven't gotten PhDs. And I think Bob Lazar falls into one of those categories. He's obviously a very smart individual. I think he wishes that he had um, masters from Caltech and and uh, MIT. But that said, uh, I would not say that he has not taken classes at Caltech and MIT. Uh, the university that he says he has his degree from is a, um, you know, Pierce, some sort of strength. Los Angeles Pierce College, which they uh, figured out <laughs> that uh, from Caltech, one of his professors, uh, Professor William Duxler, uh, math and physics professor at Pierce, who was able to determine that Lazar had taken at least one of his courses in the late seventies, um, but Duxler never caught, taught at Caltech. Um, yeah. So what what I would say is 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 this, and and that's like I've um, he worked for some sort of technical company in L.A. So I'm speculating on this. And what happens is I, I saw this when I worked at uh, the biotech company. They, they give you money. They will pay you to take continuing education courses. I took a class at uh, UC Berkeley and, um, you know, in an evening class. And they, they have these classes. So I have a feeling that Bob Lazar has taken classes at Caltech. And they were probably continuing education classes. They don't know how many he took, but he may very well have taken enough classes to you know, be the equivalent of a, a master's degree. He claims to be a bachelor of science, to have a bachelor of science degree in physics and electronic technology from Pacifica University, which is a correspondence university, which as we all know, that's not a, well, I, I know it's equivalent, I guess, but you well, know, and I know it's not the same. <laughs> no. And so, and then, well, to, to address that too, it's like, so I speculate that when he was working at uh, the electronics firm in LA, he did continuing education and they paid for it and he took some classes at Caltech. I also was thinking that when he was working for the subcontractor at Lawrence, now he did work at uh, Los Alamos and he worked for a subcontractor. Yeah. We're gonna, it's quite hey, I'm, I'm kind of going through the chronological. We'll get to that in just a second. Okay. All right. According All right. to... Uh, so they Pacifica closed in 78, so I don't think they were able to confirm that, but um, claims to have attended Cal State University in Northridge for a short time for some classes, then on to Caltech. Um, so were we able to corroborate the fact that was he in Caltech? Um, I, there is no... No record. Nobody... Nobody, but the records that people have looked at have been records for, um, yeah, I'm defending him, but the, the people are looking at records for um, matriculated students, students that have actually entered into the school for a degree program. Right. Um, the things that they've looked at, you would not see 
information for somebody that was doing continuing education. And I have a, uh, some, some people are very sensitive and they feel that they, he may be one of them. They feel that they deserve, um, you know, a degree for them, you know, whatever, because they've, they've done the work. And I saw, I was, um, there was a, um, thing I was involved with and there was a PhD who on her LinkedIn profile said she had a, um, her PhD was from MIT and it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, she, she had done her research at, um, MIT. So she, she spent all her graduate time at MIT, did the research in the lab at MIT, did her graduate work at MIT, and, but her degree was from a, a not as big a name university, not a top 10 university uh, on the West Coast. And, uh, but you could see that on her, her CV. But the thing is, is she, she put it on her LinkedIn profile that she had a um, PhD from MIT, which looks really impressive. So she felt this, I don't know this person, I've never interacted with this person. This person felt that they deserved a PhD from MIT because of all this you know, work that they'd done there and they did all the graduate work there and they worked in a lab at MIT, but that was not their her matriculating university. And I think that Bob Lazar may fall into that same category. You know, he does, you know, he, he may have taken classes, continuation, continuation classes at Caltech and he feels that he's done the equivalent of a master's degree. Uh, but right. you can't, yeah, uh, really at, at that, I, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, people do that. And people used to be able to get, get away with that more so in the past than they can now. And there's always the possibility that, you know, they've erased his records. But I don't think that's likely. You would also, if you've graduated, uh, do you still have your high school diploma? Yes, I do. Well, I mean, you hang on to that stuff. Yeah. Unless you've unless you've had a fire, and he he never came out and said, "Well, you know, I, I did have diplomas and I had a fire," and um, that that didn't happen. You keep these documents. We don't keep a lot of. I mean, you may not keep a lot of documents, but you keep the stuff that has that's important to you. Right. So, and our 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 high school diplomas aren't really worth anything, and it doesn't mean anything. I don't, but we still hang on to them. Yeah, I don't know why. So. I hang on to it. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's I've never it has had some meaning. Bruce, I've never had to produce it to anyone. I just, yeah, that, that's what it was. But, yeah. you know, and that's, I have, that's different than your PhD. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, it, that's like, it's, it's, and you have, you get this nice document and you hang on a lot yeah. of people and you put, you've put a decent amount of work into getting this thing and you treasure this document unless you don't care. Yeah. So, um, so where are we going next? Yeah, we, so he graduated from MIT. Uh, he got his PhD. He replied, "No, it was a master's." And then he went on to Los Alamos. And then you can go on to the the Los Alamos. Thing. Yeah. So, so, so it's quite possible when he was working for the subcontractor at Los Alamos, and he was working on their um, their cyclotron. Right. That he may have um, they may have sent him to take course or course couple course at uh, MIT. Right. So I'm not saying he hasn't taken classes at at, uh, at those schools. Uh, and he may just feel that he, you know, has done the equivalent amount of work to to um, have these things. So that's that's that. Uh, what's next? Oh, um, so he what where are we we're going? So we do know he did work at at, uh, at Los Alamos. Right. He probably got a recommendation from Teller to get a job at EG and right. I do believe I do believe that he has was actually hired by EG and G <clears throat> and I do believe that he did have access to the facility at Area 51 facility for a limited period of time while they were doing his background check I anticipate that uh it's, you know, you looked at that guy's site where he was critiquing him. I anticipate right. one of the one of the big things to prevent you from getting a security clearance is um, debt, or you know, bankruptcy, yeah. or you know, big debt. Because the thing is, is the 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 weakest point they perceive it as the weakest point of a person is, uh, uh, you know, debt. 
Well, they stated that in the end. Remember, they gave him the after this gig was over, and he decided he's not going back because he was afraid for his life because he would he'd compromise the the project uh, by divulging it to other people. Um, you know, he they he was given papers by Dennis, which showed his wife was having an affair with her. Tracy was having an affair with her yeah. flight instructor. So then yeah. uh, they used that as that instability as a reason that he didn't, he survived. I think he survived. I don't know if he knows this, but as a reason that they, he did not get his security clearance because he has his, his home life was tumultuous and, and risky for them for a security standpoint. I, I actually, I believe uh, these aspects of his story. I believe that he was undergoing security investigation for a clearance. I believe he worked at Area 51 for a brief period of time. Um, th what I thought was, so now we get into this, a big speculation thing, that, that critical side of him where the guy was saying they were doing proton beam experiments, right? Um, which is what he was what him and his friends were seeing. And that's a possibility. And at that time, even now, try to find information on pro the government's proton beam experiments. Um, you're not going to find much. There was something that was tested and it's in the Smithsonian now. So he did have access to, I think, classified secret technology. Uh, there was some sort of test. We don't know what the tests were at Air 51 that he became knowledgeable of and was able to bring his friends over to witness some aspects to it so there there are components of his story that i believe uh, strongly are true i do believe he underwent a rigorous background check he's probably followed and his phones were tapped and things like that um and the issues that he faced with the security people are issues be based on his you know, he went and saw these tests with friends. He had, uh, uh, it looks like he had uh, bankruptcy in his past, which is a big red flag for security clearance. He had, uh, his wife was, you know, having an affair and, and they, they saw this. So overall, I think he was perceived as a no-go for a security clearance, but they had already given him access to classified, uh, you know, facilities. Right. And then the wheels are, you know, and then the wheels are off the wagon. And I think that might be why these subcontractors are denying, I like the, the subcontractor at Los Alamos, the, uh, the reporter Knapp. Uh, they said, oh, yeah, he worked for us. We'll get you the information. And then they shut him down, shut him out. Yeah. So he, I think Bob Lazar was an embarrassment, obviously was an embarrassment to the program. I also think. He's describing how they're, you know, uh, subcontractors are sort of a strange business with the, the government subcontracts, all sorts of stuff. And the way that he described um, sort of his experiences, if you just, if you, it, it fits what you would see with like a government subcontractor. Some of these, these, these organizations are just, uh, you know, out of control and they're not very well run. And uh, so anyway. Um, so there's elements, there's elements of truth in his story. There's, I think, elements of exaggeration in his story. A, unfortunately, you can't verify uh, the, the saucer stuff, but you can verify that there was some sort of unusual test occurring at Area 51 that he had knowledge of, and he was able to bring his friends out to witness. Yeah, I, so it's, uh, you know, I want to believe... <laughs> <laughs> like everything else, um, you know, but it's it's just kind of interesting that, you know, it's, um, I, I, I agree with you. I think it was simply because he had the bankruptcy. He, he had went through a bankruptcy. He's just um, not yeah, really they, stable, they, you know. Yeah, it was a, his, his marriage. Yeah, they just looked at him as with his... He, and he had that feeling that this was happening because they were calling him out regularly out there and then they shut him out. Um, it's his security clearance went bad yeah. and it happens. So, but his, there are many, like I said, there's many elements of his story that are, um, of, I think, 
think factual. Like I said, I, I believe that he had access to the facility. I believe he was hired by the, the, the subcontractor. Um, and uh, they, he had knowledge of some sort of um, high-level tests that were happening. Yep. So, well, that's, that's what we've got. And um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining us. Dr. Bill, we appreciate it. Yep. And um, thanks for listening to the latest episode of the Alien Pro Podcast. We welcome comments and questions or requests to alienprobepodcast at gmail.com. Visit us on Facebook at alienprobe.net, Twitter at Alien Pro Pod. Thanks to our senior producer, Robert Anthony. See you next time.